Independence and impartiality, Australia's arbitrator bias test, Emma Garrett, Arbitration International, Volume 40, Issue 2, June 2024, published, 06 February 2024, Abstract. This article examines Australia's arbitrator bias test to reveal its underlying contradictions and ambiguity, and suggests that the legislation is amended to remedy these flaws and ensure Australia stays in line with international best practice. In 2010, Section 18A of the International Arbitration Act 1974, CTH, introduced the arbitrator bias test into Australian statute. The provision failed to specify both limbs of the test and relied on Goff, an outdated English case. This produced two opposing decisions from Australia's federal judiciary, Sino Dragon and Huey. The uncertainty of Australia's arbitrator bias test strikes at the heart of the process as the independence and impartiality of arbitrators is a fundamental pillar of international commercial arbitration. After critically analysing the progression of England's approach to the arbitrator bias test over the past century to date, I conclude that the inherent unclearness of Australia's approach needs to be remedied by the real possibility test being codified in Australian statute. This test reflects the Australian federal judiciary's most recent approach. My analysis also reveals it is the most appropriate test. By clarifying Australia's arbitrated bias test, those associating with Australia's international commercial arbitration system have the requisite certainty and clarity to engage with ease. Introduction. The rule against bias constitutes the very soul of the justice delivery system. Point one as a result, the uncertainty in relation to the arbitrator bias test in Australia is troubling as it strikes at the heart of international commercial arbitration. When arbitrators are subject to challenges against their independence and or impartiality, a range of different tests may be implemented to assess the allegation. These tests vary between jurisdictions, including among common law jurisdictions. These tests can be grouped into three main categories, i, the reasonable apprehension test, 2, the real danger test, and 3, the real possibility test. Each of these tests contains two limbs. The first limb determines the perspective the allegation will be assessed from, being either that of the court or of a reasonable person. The second limb sets out the threshold that must be met for the allegation to be made out. In Australia, there is a well-established common law test for bias which utilises the reasonable apprehension test. Up until the 2010 amendments to the International Arbitration Act 1974, CTH, IAA, this common law test was also used for arbitrators, since these amendments introduced Section 18A of the IAA. There has been confusion regarding the applicable arbitrator bias test in Australia, as only the second limb was expressly articulated in the provision. The provision states, 18A Article 12, justifiable doubts as to the impartiality or independence of an arbitrator. 1. For the purposes of Article 12, 1. Of the model law, there are justifiable doubts as to the impartiality or independence of a person approached in connection with a possible appointment as arbitrator only if there is a real danger of bias on the part of that person in conducting the arbitration. 2. For the purposes of Article 12, 2. Of the model law, there are justifiable doubts as to the impartiality or independence of an arbitrator, only if there is a real danger of bias on the part of the arbitrator in conducting the arbitration. As such, this article seeks to explore and resolve this provision's underlying confusion and assess what the current arbitrator bias test is in Australia, and in doing so demonstrate its unclear nature. It then determines the most preferable test to assess arbitrator bias in Australia. Terminology. Whilst the terms independence and impartiality are commonly used interchangeably and often overlap, they are distinguishable. To an arbitrator's independence refers to his or her status or relationships. Three, it concerns an arbitrator's position or situation. Four, as such, a prior relationship or connection financial or otherwise between an arbitrator and the parties, councils, and or co. Arbitrators may question an arbitrator's independence. Five, it is not only actual independence that an arbitrator must uphold but also perceived independence by third parties. Six, in contrast, impartiality goes to an arbitrator's 
state of mind, 7. An arbitrator must have an absence of bias, both actual and apprehended. 8. Impartiality goes to whether an arbitrator's thoughts regarding the subject matter of the dispute or a party are biased or seen to be point nine. Therefore, an arbitrator may be partial if there is evidence to indicate that they have prejudged an issue relevant to the dispute or favored a particular party or a third party perceives this point one zero when referring to bias. The author refers to a lack of impartiality and independence collectively. This article commences by exploring the legislative framework for Australia's arbitrator bias test. It then analyzes how this framework has been applied by the Australian Judiciary Section 2. Section 3 highlights Australia's link with the UK and reviews the UKS Judiciary's historical approach to the arbitrator bias test. It sets out the UKS leading case law from the past century to understand the judiciary's evolving and current perspective. With this knowledge, Section 4 seeks to determine which bias test should be adopted by Australia. This involves a thorough analysis of the three primary bias tests in international commercial arbitration. Finally, a conclusive summary is drawn. Section 5, Australia's arbitrator bias test is inherently unclear. How and why the arbitrator bias test for international arbitration in Australia is inherently unclear is explored below. First, the legislative framework surrounding the test is outlined to capture how it is reflected in Australian statute. This provides the relevant context to part two where the application of this test by the Australian judiciary is reviewed. In doing so, the problem that this article aims to rectify is detailed. Legislative framework, Australia has incorporated both the Model Law 11 and the New York Convention 12 into its legal framework through the IAA 13 which covers Australia's federal jurisdiction. By aligning itself with globally recognized norms, Australia's commitment to fostering a conducive environment for international arbitration is clear. The individual states and territories of Australia each have their own arbitration legislation, which predominantly mirror the IAA. State and territory courts have jurisdiction to deal with both domestic and international arbitration, whereas the Federal Court of Australia Federal Court is only authorized to deal with international arbitration. 14. Also within the federal vein are the full court of the federal court and the high court of Australia high court. Both sit above the federal court with the high court as the pinnacle of Australia's judiciary. The focus of this article will be on the IAA as it is more reflective of Australia's position in international arbitration. Australia is a model law plus country as it has enacted and added to the model law precedent. 15. This is important as it does so in relation to Article 12. 2. Of the model law which provides that there must be justifiable doubts as to the arbitrator's impartiality or independence for the arbitrator to be successfully challenged. In 2010, the International Arbitration Amendment Act 2010, CTH, IAA Amendment Act, was introduced, seeking to introduce a pro-enforcement bias. 16. This Act adopted the 2006 changes to the model law along with other important reforms to Australia's international arbitration regulatory framework. 17. Relevantly, the IAA Amendment Act added Section 18A. 2. Of the IAA which clarifies that justifiable doubts as contained in Article 12. 2. Of the model law will only exist where there is a real danger of bias on behalf of the arbitrator. 18. By doing so, Australia became the first country to adopt real danger into its legislation and the first model law member to add to the provision on arbitrator, independence and impartiality. 19. The intention was that it would be harder for an arbitrator to be successfully challenged on bias grounds due to the stricter test. 20. The revised explanatory memorandum, International Arbitration Amendment Bill 2010, CTH, explanatory memorandum, explained that at the time, arbitrators and judges in Australia were subject to the same apparent bias test. 21. The common law set out the reasonable apprehension test as expressed in R.V. Sussex Justices, 1924, 1 kilobyte 256 Sussex Justices, point two to this leading English case is explored further below. It was then stated that this was not consistent with the principles underpinning arbitration, and therefore it was appropriate to attach a different standard to arbitrators. 
23 in determining what test should be applied to arbitrate as the explanatory. Memorandum referred to a recommendation naming R versus Goff. 1993 AC 646. Goff and its approach to bias adopted in the UK.24. It is then expressly noted that justifiable doubts as to the impartiality or independence of an arbitrator is the real danger of bias test set out in R versus Goff.25 in Goff. The House of Lords clarified the correct bias test. Below, the Court of Appeal had utilized the real danger test, rather than the reasonable apprehension test to determine whether bias arose in a matter where, following a trial, it was discovered that a juror was the defendant's brother's neighbor. 26. The House of Lords agreed with the Court of Appeal's utilization of the real danger test. 27. Consequently, Goff introduced a new bias test by changing both the perspective and threshold of the reasonable apprehension test set out in Sussex Justices. Goff altered the perspective from a reasonable person to the court itself, with the new threshold being real danger instead of reasonable apprehension. See further discussion below. Section 18A of the IAA only expressly adopted the second arm of the Goff test with respect to the threshold standard, real danger. It did not address the first arm which is the vantage that the test should be viewed from, being that of the reasonable court in Goff, 28 as such. It is not clear whether the first arm of the Goff test is also relevant. It appears as if the lawmakers during the legislative process deliberately failed to articulate the first limb of the bias test, as an amendment to the first limb was also suggested. 29 this may have been because they wanted the learned judges to decide on this issue and formulate the first limb via case law instead. Overall, this legislative amendment was designed to alter Australia's common law position with respect to arbitrators. 30. Notably, at this time, the Goff test for bias was no longer the current approach in the UK.31 in 2010, the current, and already well-established, test for bias in the UK was the real possibility test set down in Porter v. Magill, 2002. 2AC 357, Porter v. McGill, the origins and adoption of this test are elaborated upon in the subsequent discussion. Therefore, from the date that Section 18A of the IAA was introduced, its interpretation and application as expressed by the explanatory memorandum were not current law in the UK. As such, the question is whether this should have been the approach expressed in the explanatory memorandum, or whether it should have referred to another test. Section 3 explores the various tests throughout the past century in the UK to shed light on these questions. Why was the arbitrator bias test expressly introduced for arbitrators in Australia prior to the IAA Amendment Act being approved? Australia's Attorney General sought submissions from various organisations, legal practitioners, judges, barristers and academics to understand which proposed amendments should be adopted. 32 After almost two years of discussion and various rounds of submissions, the current IAA Amendment Act entered into force on the 6th of July, 2010. The inclusion of an express provision on the arbitrated bias test was not a proposal made by the Attorney General. 33 But one that was recommended in two of the 25 submissions 34 received in response to the Attorney General's call for comments. 35 one submission suggested adopting the real danger test set out in Goff to ensure arbitrators are subject to a stricter test, making it tougher for arbitrators to be successfully challenged. 36. This difficulty arises from the fact that the real danger test requires the bias to be proven to a higher standard, so parties bringing a challenge against an arbitrator would have a greater burden to discharge to be successful. This argument was twofold. It will deter meritless claims, saving time and costs, and, as arbitrators are not part of the judiciary, they should not be subject to the same level of scrutiny as judges. 37. Litigation and arbitration were differentiated to ensure arbitration was adequately accommodated. However, in line with the recent decision of Halliburton Company v. Chuck Bermuda Insurance Limited 2020, UKSC 48, Halliburton. A different test is not needed for arbitrators and judges to accommodate the intricacies of international commercial arbitration. 38. The same test can be applied differently to ensure that the variances between arbitration and litigation are accommodated. As previously noted, whilst both limbs of Goff were recommended, 
39 only the second limb was adopted. 40. The second submission recommended the real possibility test set out in Porter versus McGill. Discuss below. The reasons being that this was the current test in England, and the scarcity of Australian court decisions on independence and impartiality required the test to be codified in legislation to ensure clarity and promote trust and confidence. 41 This test was not adopted, leaving one to question why an incomplete adoption of the first suggestion, which was old English law, was codified instead of England's current test. I believe it was because this submission was far shorter with less reasoning than the former. The former was also jointly written by a senior arbitration practitioner, who had a plethora of other relevant experience, that is, minister in the federal government and member of the federal parliament, and an academic who had focused his PhD on the adoption of the above-mentioned test. 42. Only two federal cases have actively addressed Section 18A of the IAA, and explored what the arbitrator bias test is in Australia. These will be explored next to exemplify how their interpretation of the legislative framework has made its use in practice inherently unclear. Case law. In Australia, only Sino Dragon Trading Limited versus Noble Resources International Pty Limited 2016, FCA 1131, Sino Dragon and Hui vs. Esposito Holdings Pty Limited 2017, FCA 648 Hui have explored what the test for arbitrator bias is under Section 18A of the IAA. These cases were both handed down for judgment by Beach J of the Federal Court in September 2016 and June 2017, respectively. However, in each of these cases, His Honor came to a different conclusion. Sino Dragon. In Sino Dragon, His Honor held that the real danger test applied when determining whether there are justifiable doubts as to an arbitrator's independence or impartiality. 43 In this case, the applicant challenged two of the three arbitrators for giving rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias. 44 The bias allegedly stemmed from the two arbitrators' interest in the result of the arbitration, an or apparent or actual conflict and or because the mode of appointment was not complied with. 45. The applicant noted that one of the arbitrators currently worked at the same firm as the respondent's lawyers, and that the other had previously worked for the firm. 46. The argument made regarding the mode of appointment was quickly dismissed. His Honor observed that the applicant had confused the legal test for bias as Section 18A of the IAA, prescribes the real danger test from Goff, 47 and held that neither situation constituted a real danger of bias. His Honor's reasons included that I, the arbitrator's worst stroke had been associated with the Australian entity of the firm, which had no partnership with the Chinese firm acting for the respondent. 2. Neither had done any legal work for the respondent or connected companies. And 3. The connections were of 8.48. His Honor also noted that the appointing authority of the Tribunal 49 had already dismissed a challenge to two of the arbitrators on the basis that there was no real danger of bias nor any lack of impartiality in general and agreed with his reasons. 50. This decision was not challenged by the applicant. 51. His Honor found that there was nothing to indicate that the arbitrators were biased. 52. In doing so, His Honor noted that the test provided under Section 18A of the IAA for arbitrators was not the same as common law. 53. He then mentioned the explanatory memorandum which referenced Goff and its test that incorporates notions of real danger of bias from the perspective of the court as opposed to merely that of a reasonable layperson.54 Consequently, Beach J understood this to be the perspective of Section 18A of the IAA. 55. Interestingly, His Honor failed to acknowledge or consider that this test was no longer current law in England. This is questionable as the legislature had not expressly set out the first limb of the test in Goff. This limb had been replaced by a new English judgment 14 years prior to Beach J's decision. The submissions received by the Attorney General recommending the adoption of the Goff test expressly set out both limbs of the Goff test in their advocated provision, as the legislation only expressly reflected the second limb of the Goff test, there was discretion for his honor to interpret the first limb, regardless of what was in the explanatory memorandum. In doing so, it would have made sense to consider the current approach in England given the second limb was explicitly taken from English case law, 
As such, it was not compulsory that his honor apply the real danger test, merely the real danger threshold. There was minimal discussion by academics and legal professionals on this case in relation to the bias test. Where there was, the focus was generally on the contrasting views of Beach J in this matter, and with his judgment in who he discussed next, or with the facts of the case, 56 no deeper analysis has been found by the author. The author believes this case is reflective of the interpretation one gets when first reading the provision. It appears straightforward with its explicit reference to a real danger of bias. 57 is made clear by Beach J. This interpretation is also supported by the provision's explanatory memorandum. However, as is unraveled throughout this article, once you look beyond the provision and explanatory memorandum, this is not so. A real danger of bias alone does not constitute the real danger test. This demonstrates the unclear nature of the provision. One should not be required to undertake a deep analysis to ensure the provision's appropriate application. It should be explicit. Hui, in Hui, his honor held that a correct perspective of the test expressed in section 18a of the IAA was that of the reasonable bystander or reasonable man.58. This case reflects the latest and fullest analysis of Australia's federal arbitrator bias. Test 59 in this case, the applicant and two of the three respondents argued that a partial award ought to be set aside as the arbitrator had prejudged the matter and was therefore not impartial. 60 as such, these parties argued that a reasonable person would not have confidence in the arbitrator being able to arrive at a fair and balanced conclusion on these allegedly prejudged Issues point six one his honor granted the set aside in this matter in what he described as exceptional circumstances point six two prejudgment was said to arise from the arbitrator's conduct following a preliminary hearing which addressed a set of agreed upon issues sixty three the arbitrator's award addressing the hearing went beyond these claims sixty four thus the applicant filed submissions to challenge the arbitrator's award as the arbitrator exceeded jurisdiction and prejudged issues. 65. The arbitrator then held a further hearing allowing the parties to address the applicant's challenge, and whether the arbitrator's reasons were substantially wrong, as he was open to argument. Point six six. His honor commented that this was odd as the arbitrator appeared to have already determined these matters and ruled accordingly. 67. A hearing regarding the applicant's challenge followed. 68. The arbitrator delivered additional reasons thereafter, whereby he attempted to retrospectively remedy his prejudgment and determined that he would not withdraw. 69. His honor noted that this prejudgment alone would be enough reason for the arbitrator to withdraw. 70. The applicant submitted another challenge against the arbitrator submitting that a reasonable person would no longer have confidence that the arbitrator could come to a fair and balanced conclusion on the issues if he were to reconsider them. Point seven one, the arbitrator delivered a further set of reasons and two partial awards and refused to withdraw. 72. In addressing the prejudgment, his honor noted the debate about what perspective that is, the first limb of the bias test. The test outlined in section 18A of the IAA refers to 2.73. This was not considered by his honor in Sino Dragon. As such, this case already attains a deeper reasoning process. His honor commented that the Goff perspective did not support Australia's reasonable bystander test established at common law. 74 Furthermore, his honor noted that in Sino Dragon, he was prepared to accept the Goff perspective was implicitly enacted in section 18A of the IAA. 75 however, in this matter, his honor found that the correct perspective even for the English real danger test is that of the reasonable bystander or reasonable man, when actual bias is not alleged. Point seven six. in doing so, his honor ensured that Australia's arbitrator bias test was not misaligned with well-established common law. This is important as judges are obliged to follow the common law, where legislation does not prohibit it. As the legislation made no express reference to the first limb, His Honor had discretion to interpret the appropriate perspective. In my opinion, His Honor was correct to side with the common law, as it is important to maintain in the absence of substantial justification for dissent. So, what changed between September 2016 and June 2017? that persuaded his honor that there were insufficient grounds for opposing the common law. His honor expressly acknowledged the submissions of Mr. Graham Yoran KC in this regard. However, 
The author was denied access to these submissions. As such, it was only possible to broadly understand why his honor's reasoning changed. His honor noted that the common law perspective was the better and correct view as section 18a did not comment on perspective. And the perspective in England since Goff had changed, 77, due to his honor's reference to England's new approach. It is critical to understand their approach to inform the interpretation of Australia's. This also shows the willingness of Australian courts to keep their jurisprudence in line with England's, where possible and appropriate. Here, it was possible due to his honor's discretion and appropriate as it concerns international commercial arbitration. As international commercial arbitration is global, it is best to keep the approaches the same to ensure consistency across jurisdictions. His honor held that the correct test was whether a reasonable person would no longer have confidence in the arbitrator's ability to come to a fair and balanced conclusion on the issues if remitted 0.78 subsequently. His honor found that the arbitrator in this matter had not acted in a way that the parties could have confidence in him, partly because he had prejudged key issues. 79. Consequently, his honor adopted the vantage point of the reasonable person for the first limb of the arbitrated bias test, in accordance with Australia's common law test, for judicial bias and only, upheld Goff's second limb with respect to the real danger threshold. This means that the Goff test was not applied in full. This case demonstrates the multitude of considerations and layers hidden beyond the provisions for SPARD. It established that the provision's initial discernible interpretation was not the appropriate one. Once his honor delved into a deeper analysis of the provision, it was clear that the provision's implicit adoption of the real danger test was inapt. This was no longer the current test in the UK, and this test was less aligned to Australia's common law than the alternative. Thus, making the provision intrinsically unclear due to two opposing interpretations by the same judge within a short time frame. Whilst statutory interpretation is part of the judiciary's role, this interpretation should not be made difficult by a provision's ambiguity, where it is easily remedied by the legislature. These two cases demonstrate what happens when the legislature fails to be clear and precise when enacting law. Case law reflects the two available outcomes under Section 18 Ampere's. Prior to case law applying Section 18A of the IAA, there were two available outcomes to the application of Australia's arbitrated bias test, 81 being that both limbs of the Goff test apply, as seen in Sino Dragon, the other being that the first limb reflects Australia's common law and applies the fair-minded and informed observer perspective, as opposed to the courts, as seen in Hui. Some contend that the position adopted in Hui is inconsistent with the legislative objective of Section 18A of the IAA due to the reference to adopting Goff in the explanatory memorandum. 81, however, as noted above, both limbs of the Goff test were expressly recommended and only the second limb was expressly adopted. The Goff test itself is not adopted in Hui as a different first limb to the two-part test was chosen. Instead, in Hui, Beach J sought to preserve Australia's common law as predicted by Luttrell. 82 Luttrell also predicted that this case would be won at first instance. 83, there have been no further decisions to support or change this position so it will be interesting to see if anything changes once this issue is heard beyond first instance. Case law highlights the uncertainty of Australia's arbitrator bias test. Case law reflects the inherently unclear nature of Australia's arbitrator bias test and the limited discussion surrounding this issue. Sino Dragon demonstrates that the legislation appears to outline a clear approach. However, Hui evidences that the provisions approach stands on flawed reasoning, in part because it fails to expressly state both limbs of the test. Whilst Hui still stands, it remains uncertain how the bias test should be applied due to the very limited authorities, and the decision being won at first instance, 84 it therefore remains open for other Australian federal judges to change the current approach, leaving the test in Australia relatively unclear and open to academic debate. 85 with no legislative reform, the approach will remain uncertain until higher courts deal with the matter. This is troublesome for international commercial arbitration users seeking to engage with Australia and may dissuade them from doing so. Australia's reliance on the UKS common law makes the UKS progression to the real possibility of bias test relevant. 
It is clear from Beach J's decision in Hui that Australia's current approach to the arbitrator bias test is influenced by the progression of the common law in the UK following off. 86. It is therefore important to examine the case law to determine whether Beach J's conclusion was correct. As such, I will continue by examining the preeminent cases concerning the bias test within the UK's judiciary over the past century. This discussion is particularly relevant as the UK's common law was initially used to support the test adopted in section 18A of the IAA. It was then used by the Australian judiciary to interpret and amend this test link between Australian and English courts. Up until 1975, the Australian High Court was bound to follow the UK's Privy Council's decisions. 87 since then, Australia has developed its own body of common law and diverged from English laws in some instances. This divergence can be seen with the different approaches currently adopted by England and Australia, with respect to arbitrator bias, although no longer formally binding, Australia is still heavily influenced by English decisions. 88 as evidenced in this article, both jurisdictions look at and rely upon court decisions of the other to help inform best practice. Due to the long reigning authority of the Privy Council, Australia has had limited capacity to develop its own distinct common law. 89 Additionally, England has had greater opportunity to develop and tailor their jurisprudence with respect to arbitrator bias as they are a far more popular arbitration seat than Australia. Following the introduction of Section 18A of the IAA on arbitrator bias in mid-2010, only two cases, heard in 2016 and 2017, have significantly dealt with this provision, whereas England's arbitrator bias test is the same as judges, and is embedded in the common law, which goes back centuries. Thus, a large body of common law has developed, the most important of which will be outlined now, the reasonable apprehension test. Sussex Justices In Sussex Justices, the High Court of Justice determined whether a matter had to be overturned due to an allegation of bias. Here, the applicant had been convicted for dangerous driving, but appealed the conviction on the basis that the Justice's acting clerk, who worked at the same firm as the opposing side's solicitors, retired with the justices at the conclusion of the evidence where they decided to convict. In assessing the allegation of bias, the court made express reference to the appearance of bias. 90 and elaborated that case law required that justice should not only be done, but should manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. Point nine one. the court noted that whilst the clerk had retired with the justices, and the justices had made the decision without him, this did not prevent the appearance of bias. 92 Accordingly, the question was whether there was an appearance of bias, not if there was bias. This displays a low bar. The court held that even though there was no actual demonstrated bias, the appearance of bias required the below decision to be quashed. 93 The implication being that decisions can be overturned without there being any real risk of bias. Rather it need only reasonably appear so. Consequently, the bias test developed was whether a reasonable person with knowledge of the material facts would have reasonably apprehended that the arbitrator was biased. 94. Whilst this put a lower threshold on parties seeking to establish bias, it put a higher standard on decision makers seeking to avoid bias. 95. This test is followed by most common law countries, including Australia for judicial bias. 96. This demonstrates that despite the high standard placed on decision makers, it is a widely accepted bias test. The principle established in this case conveys a powerful message and sets a high standard for decision makers to uphold. It goes a long way to ensuring that justice is attained. This raises the question of why it was overturned. If justice is put at the forefront is that not always appropriate? Justice requires that a balance is struck between the various competing principles of due process and fair hearing along with the independence and impartiality of decision makers. This decision takes a cautious approach to ensuring that justice appears to be done. However, in doing so also risks undermining just decisions based on fanciful accusations. One can see the difficulty in attempting to strike a balance between the two. The real danger test, Goff. Prior to Goff, it was said that the elements of apparent bias, degree and perspective were difficult to reconcile. 97 as demonstrated in section 2. This remains true in certain jurisdictions. 
This ongoing debate and historical reach highlight the complexities and intricacies of this topic and the need for clarity. In Goff, 98, the court ultimately held that the degree of bias required was real danger, and the perspective was that of the court. 99, as briefly set out above, the House of Lords determined whether the Court of Appeal applied the correct bias test, real danger, when evaluating whether a juror was influenced by the fact that the convicted individual's brother was her neighbor. 100, the juror only became aware of this connection after the trial. So it was for the court to determine whether this irregularity affected the trial. The Court of Appeal established that it was not likely, or even possible, that the decision had been impacted by bias. The House of Lords thus proceeded on this basis and merely determined the correct test. 101 in doing so, the House of Lords noted that there were two available tests. Whether there was a real danger of bias, or whether a reasonable person may reasonably suspect bias, 102 whilst acknowledging the principle laid out in Sussex Justices, 103, the House of Lords determined that the real danger test would satisfy the principle that justice is manifestly seen to be done. 104 Ampere's more rigorous criterion is that in Sussex Justices was not required. 105 under the premise that decisions would be more difficult to overturn on bias challenges due to the higher standard, but that this higher standard did not compromise the fundamental premise of the rule against bias, justice. The House of Lords also altered the test so that it was from the perspective of the court, rather than a reasonable man. 106. This was intended to lessen the burden on the court with respect to the extra step of imputing matters. 107. Whilst a good intention, as is made clear later, this detracted from the public's perception, a matter considered fundamental in the administration of justice. Thus, Whilst it might be considered a relatively minor matter, the implications of this change were large. Lord Wolfe noted that if a court finds there is no danger the alleged bias created in justice, then the decision should not be quashed. To exemplify, he stated that had the court in Sussex justices used this test, the below decision would not have to be overturned as the appearance of bias did not amount to a danger of injustice. 108 Goff changed the Sussex justices' test twofold. The test would be viewed from the court's perspective instead of the reasonable man, and the threshold would be higher as a real danger of bias had to be made out, not just a reasonable apprehension. Importantly, the test was framed as being possible and desirable for both judges and arbitrators. 109. This is reflective of the long-standing principle that arbitrators and judges can be subject to the same bias test. This point is particularly relevant given Australia's decision to differentiate them. The test developed in this decision stands in stark contrast to that in Sussex justices. In attempting to strike the appropriate balance, the scales were tipped in the opposite direction. This case placed a high burden on the parties rather than the decision maker. The attempt was valiant in seeking to preserve just decisions. However, it is questionable with respect to its lack of public perception. This case leaves room for a more even balance to be struck to ensure that the public's view of justice is not compromised in the attempt to ensure justice is upheld. The real possibility test. Medicaments. In re-medicaments and related classes of goods. Number 2. Medicaments. 110. The Court of Appeal was required to determine whether either one member of the Restrictive Practices Court, Dr. Rowlett, or the whole of the Restrictive Practices Court due to Dr. Rowlett infecting it, or to be recused due to apparent bias. 111, the appellant alleged that Dr. Rowlett was apparently biased as she contacted the economic consultancy firm of one of the party's principal expert witnesses for a job. 112, Dr. Rowlett noted that she had forgotten about the connection when she called and had she remembered she would not have done so. 113, she noted that she retained the essential independence of mind required and refused to recuse herself. 114 on appeal. The essential question was whether this gave rise to either a real danger of bias or reasonable apprehension of bias. 115. The below court found that the test for bias was whether there were legitimate grounds for fearing a lack of impartiality, however slight the justification, and held that Dr. Rowlett's conduct presented no justification for fear of partiality. 116, the appellants appealed to the Court of Appeal arguing that the test for bias was in fact that of an objective onlooker, 
and whether they held a reasonable apprehension that Dr. Rowlett may be biased. 117. The court was thus required to look at the law in relation to bias. 118. It observed the criticism attractive to the tests in Sussex Justices and Goff. Goff had attracted forceful criticism and was not universally approved by Commonwealth countries. 119. Importantly, the court acknowledged Australia's High Court decision in Webb versus the Queen, 1994, 181 CLR 41, Webb, and its critical analysis that Goff's approach could let a court to reach a conclusion that does not mirror the view of an informed observer. 120. This question, the foundational principle that justice must not only be done, but must also manifestly be seen to be done. 121. This is significant as the administration of justice rests on public confidence in the system. 122. It also highlights the willingness of courts to look at fellow Commonwealth jurisdictions to inform their decisions. The court also questioned the continued jurisprudence of Sussex justices due to its allowance of fanciful suspicions of bias permitting a matter being quashed. 123. The court demonstrated the overarching flaws of each test to highlight why a third test should be introduced. This was important to ensure that the House of Lords would also recognize this need for change to ensure the adoption of new common law precedent. The court decided the test in Goff should be adjusted. It determined that it must consider the circumstances which bear on whether there was bias, and consider if this would cause a fair-minded and informed observer to conclude that there was a real possibility or a real danger of bias. 124. The court found that real possibility and real danger were the same. 125. The court further justified this test by stating that it was now reflective of the approach taken by most other Commonwealth countries. 126. As a result, the Court of Appeal amended the test in Goff with respect to the bias test's first limb. It changed the perspective of the test to a reasonable person instead of the court, whilst supplementing real danger with real possibility. Having ascertained the correct test, the court concluded that a fair-minded observer would find that Dr. Rowlett was in real danger of being partial and would therefore have to recuse herself. 127. Consequently, the court determined that the entire restrictive practices court would have to stand down as there had already been much discussion between the other two members and Dr. Rowlett due to the advanced stage of the case. 128. As one academic put it, this case ended the jurisprudential life of the real danger standard, set in Goff.129 Academics have agreed with the court that this was a modest change. 130 However, it ensured the public's appearance of justice was upheld and the sanctity of just decisions preserved. Far-fetched challenges would not prevail. However, for Goff to be overridden completely, the House of Lords would have to weigh in. Porter v. Magill, in dealing with an allegation of apparent bias, the House of Lords in Porter v. Magill confirmed the bias test laid down in medicaments. This support clarified the UKS bias test. In this case, there was an allegation that the auditor Mr. Magill displayed apparent bias and therefore ought to be removed. 131. The auditor was required to be impartial to ensure his independence and objectiveness in determining whether local councillors had acted unlawfully. Calling the auditor's impartiality into question was the auditor's public statement about his provisional findings on a matter prior to any oral hearing. 132. The auditor denied bias having applied the Goff test for apparent bias to himself and refused to resign. 133. Focus will be on Lord Hope of Craighead's reasons as he gave detailed reasons concerning the apparent bias allegation, which were agreed. Lord Hope noted the Goff test had been criticized by Australia's High Court in Webb, also mentioned in Medicaments, due to the emphasis on the court's view and lack of public perception. 134 as Australia's highest court. This criticism had weight, and was important in ensuring that the UK did not fall out of touch with other Commonwealth jurisdictions. Lord Hope then recognized the reasonable apprehension test's adoption in many common law jurisdictions and its alignment with Strasbourg's jurisprudence. Unlike Goff.135 again, this acknowledgement was important to ensure the UK remained in line with international best practice. His Lordship acknowledged that these diverging tests had caused difficulties with judicial reasoning and that an adjustment to Goff would resolve these problems.
thus putting any debaters to the correct bias test to rest, as such an influential jurisdiction generally and particularly so within the international arbitration space, this clarification was paramount. 136 subsequently, the House of Lords adopted the approach taken by the Court of Appeal in Medicaments, whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. Point one three seven. However, the House of Lords removed real danger from the test, stating that it was not necessary and not in line with Strasbourg jurisprudence. 138 Having clarified the bias test once and for all, it was held that objectively, the auditor showed no real possibility of bias. 139 Porter versus Magill clarifies the ongoing debate between the two former bias tests by reaching a compromise. The first element of the test reflects the vantage point adopted in Sussex justices, and the second reflects the threshold in Goff. 140 The common law countries that did follow Goff now generally follow Porter versus Magill, which exemplifies the wide, reaching influence of this decision. 141 Finally, the principle established in this case extended to apparent bias on behalf of other decision makers, not solely judges. 142. The real danger test is not the current bias test in the UK, Australia, and the UK have a symbiotic relationship with one another, each borrowing from each other's case law to help develop their own. This was evident in Medicaments and Porter versus Magill, and their reference to Australia's High Court decision at Webb which was particularly influential in their amendment of the bias test. It highlights the reliance that Commonwealth countries, particularly the UK and Australia, have on each other with respect to establishing the common law. This is important as it is this reliance that helped shape Australia's current bias test, and is what will help clarify it. It is also important as it establishes the judges and other legal professionals can draw from the other jurisdiction where necessary. Unraveling the bias test's development in the UK over the past century revealed that it went from the reasonable apprehension test to the real danger test, to finally, the real possibility test. The two important shifts from the latter two tests being that the perspective of the test is from the fair-minded and informed observer, rather than the court, and the threshold is that of real possibility, nothing more. 143 By demonstrating the bias test's progression in the UK's common law, I was able to establish that Goff and its real danger test are no longer current law in the UK. This leads one to question what the approach should be in Australia. Should Australia amend their legislation so it aligns with the UK's evolution since Goff? The next section will determine the most appropriate bias test to guide Australia forward by providing a necessary clarification for those engaging in Australia's international arbitration arena. Australia should codify the real possibility test for arbitrator bias. Section 2 outlined how Australia's arbitrator bias test is inherently unclear. Section 3 demonstrated Australia's link with the UK and how the test for arbitrator bias has developed over the past century in the UK. This section will first highlight the divergence between the three bias tests by comparing them against each other to subsequently figure out what the implications of these differences are. The deeper analysis of the various bias tests will inform the determination of what arbitrated bias test is most appropriate and should be adopted in Australia. Three prominent bias tests, a deep dive. I will now examine and distinguish the three prominent and competing tests for apparent bias in the leading seats for international commercial arbitration across the globe. 144 each of the three tests has two different limbs, perspective and threshold. It is within these limbs that the tests vary. Reasonable apprehension test v. real danger test. The reasonable apprehension test is well established within common law jurisdictions. 145 and is the test followed by judges in Australia. 146 many consider this a strength as it places the independence and impartiality of its judges at its apex by holding them to a higher standard than the other tests. 147 The test derives from the manifest justice principle. 148 And embodies a lower threshold to uphold the appearance of justice by ensuring that an objective assessment is made from the perspective of a reasonable observer. 149 This brings focus to maintaining public confidence. 150 It rests on the idea that justice must be rooted in confidence 
and confidence is destroyed when right-minded people go away thinking, the judge was biased. Point one five one in this sense, the test is best suited for safeguarding the appearance of impartiality as it gives real and substantive meaning to the constitutional requirement that disputes be resolved impartially. 152 This principle is now considered to be a doctrinal purpose. Point one five three. This approach has also attracted criticism. One criticism being the cost the low threshold has on the judiciary. 154 It is easier to overturn decisions for relatively minor reasons, triggering further costs and time. The low threshold also fails to consider the balance that courts must strike to maintain the effective administration of justice. 155 A perception of bias must be balanced with justice being done. If adjudicators are struck off too easily then other parties may suffer time and cost constraints. Thus, this test makes it very difficult in marginal cases. 156 However, there is widespread agreement that confidence in the judiciary is worth this price. 157 A decision maker who does not appear impartial is as useless to the process as an umpire who allows the trial by battle to be fouled or an augura who tampers with the entrails. 158 Defined above in Goff, the real danger test has the highest threshold of the three tests for satisfying a challenge. 159 This high threshold was enacted to ensure that low, merit bias challenges would not easily succeed by requiring that any party seeking to challenge an arbitrator's independence or impartiality would have to do so to a higher standard. 160 The intention was to remove strategic challenges used as a means to interrupt proceedings and ensure the speed and finality of matters. 161. This approach has however been heavily criticized for its emphasis on the court's view of the facts. The first limb requires the test to be completed from the perception of the court itself. 162. Consequently, this test inadequately portrays the public's perception of the alleged apparent bias and subsequently inadequately upholds the public's trust in the administration of justice. 163. Essentially, it is a subjective, judge-focused, Approach point one six four. Furthermore, Dean J and Wed noted that this test took the threshold so high that it became actual but unconscious bias instead of apparent bias. One hundred and sixty five overall. Their honors in Web were very critical of the real danger test and concluded that it is too stringent a test. Point one six six. Such comments from a long-standing Australian High Court decision. Make it surprising that Australia's legislature adopted this test with respect to international arbitration. If it was considered too stringent for judicial bias and other statutory officers, is it not for arbitrator bias as well? The real danger test and the reasonable apprehension test fall at either end of the spectrum with respect to the threshold required to make a successful bias challenge. The reasonable apprehension test uses the mere appearance of bias as the standard needed to satisfy an allegation of apparent bias, whereas the real danger test requires the alleging party to satisfy that the apparent bias is proven to the degree that there was a real danger of bias to that person. Real danger means that one is thinking in terms of possibility rather than probability. 167 danger being the possibility of a bad thing. Point 168 in this sense. The reasonable apprehension test allows for a margin of error, as it requires the mere apprehension of bias to exist. Whereas the real danger test requires a finding that the facts point to a real danger. If all the facts are not known, the real danger test may prevent a finding of bias which would have been made, had all the facts been known. 169 Thus, the low threshold of the reasonable apprehension test offsets potential error. The tests also differ as the thresholds are determined by different vantage points. 170. The reasonable apprehension test from the perspective of a reasonable person, and the real danger test from the court's perspective. This difference purportedly impacts the decision maker's credit, as the reasonable apprehension test only requires an apprehension of bias to be proven to disqualify a decision maker. Applications under this test will rarely impeach the decision maker's credit. Therefore, essentially removing their character from the test. 171 Whereas, the real danger test has more focus on the decision maker and subjects them to more criticism. 172 This means the decision makers themselves are more protected under the reasonable apprehension test. Furthermore, the reasonable apprehension test differs in a positive manner from the real danger test 
as it places more confidence in the public's perception. 173. Real Danger Test v. Real Possibility Test The Real Possibility Test introduced a modest change to the Real Danger Test by rejecting the Real Danger Test's first limb, that the court's view was the determinative factor. Instead, it adopted the court's perspective of the fair-minded and informed observer of the public. 174 Although, criticism remains as it is still the court that attaches knowledge to the observer, the same knowledge the court itself holds. 175. Some argue that this is essentially the same process as required in the real danger test, except it is concealed weakly by an objective test point 176. However, as it is important that public confidence is maintained, this is an important adaptation. 177. Justice must be seen to be done by the public, not just the courts. 178. As such, this test arguably upholds the twin objectives, being that justice is both done and seen to be done, to a higher extent than the real danger test. 179. The real danger and real possibility tests are dissimilar due to the different perspectives of their first limbs. There is no difference between real danger and real possibility. 180. Real possibility can establish the real danger test. Point 181. Therefore, the difference in the two tests rests entirely on the assessment vantage point. 182, however, as the difference is considered slight, it is likely that both vantage points would lead to the same result in practice. 183, importantly, however, the real possibility test is set to assist decision makers depersonalize the issue and analyze themselves with more ease. 184, making out apparent bias from the court's view essentially requires finding that you and fellow decision makers would find the allegation created a real danger of bias. Whereas it would be easier for one to find that a member of the public may think so. As such, the real possibility test ensures a more objective response with respect to the first limb, not only in the sense that the court takes on the persona of a reasonable person, but because by doing so the court is more easily able to acknowledge where there may have been apparent bias without bringing themselves, or others, into disarray. Reasonable apprehension test v. real possibility test. The general view is that the reasonable apprehension test and the real possibility test are different. 185. The obvious difference between the tests is the markedly higher evidentiary burden imposed by the real possibility test than the reasonable apprehension test. 186. Some go a step further to say that the two tests produce different results. 187. However, the more common view is that the tests may differ with respect to the reasoning process rather than the tests producing profoundly different results. 188 Both tests convey the same idea with respect to the perspective the court must take when determining whether there has been apparent bias, being the court's construction of a fictional observer. Point 189 Again though, there has been criticism with this element of the tests as the objective nature of these tests is said to generally be a mirage to a decision-maker's subjective opinions instead of an actual objective person. 190, however, this approach is said to continue to be the best vessel to test the claims of bias. Point 191. Australia should adopt the real possibility test for arbitrator bias. The common understanding for apparent bias is that it is an objective test that rests on the dictum that justice must be both done and seen to be done. 192, however, this standard is applied differently in each of the three formulations of the bias test. Each of the tests has attempted to uphold this dictum whilst also ensuring that meritless objections are discouraged and fail. 193 In doing so, it is clear from the above analysis that all three forms of the bias test have attracted criticism. Conversely, it is also clear that all three have their own positives. As such, there is no easy choice for which test is best. However, it is my opinion that the real possibility test is currently the most appropriate for Australia and should therefore be codified in Section 18A of the IAA. The real possibility test ensures that the twin justice objectives are upheld, despite the differences between the tests identified above, and the extensive academic and judicial debate on which is to be preferred. Judges and academics have noted that practically, these differences will rarely result in a different decision. However, there are also those who believe that each of the tests produces different results, 194 that is, 
that challengers using the real possibility or real danger tests have a lower chance of success than a challenge utilizing the reasonable apprehension test. 195 due to the higher threshold placed on the two former tests. Littrell argues that for this reason, the former tests are better suited for international commercial arbitration. 196. Alternatively, some argue that for the administration of justice to be upheld, the utmost standard must be set for bias challenges, which requires a lower threshold test. 197 public confidence is more likely to be upheld where the decision maker utilizes a test reflecting the ordinary and reasonable person of the public as reflected in the two lower threshold tests. 198. Importantly, this also depersonalizes the issue for the decision maker to ensure that apprehended bias is acknowledged where appropriate. This would be harder to acknowledge from the perspective of your peers rather than the public. Therefore, making the real danger test least appropriate in this respect. The bias test's threshold should not permit the arbitration process to break down entirely by permitting the subjective removal of arbitrators for matters that do not satisfy the judiciary's threshold test for bias. 199 to ensure that the two policy objectives are upheld. Disqualification can neither be made too easy so as to cause the level of costs and delay to become improper to all of those involved but also cannot be so hard that cases are heard swiftly but unfairly. 200 in this way, the real possibility test is suitable. It maintains a higher level of protection to international arbitration than the reasonable apprehension test, whilst also ensuring that public confidence is maintained, which the real danger test fails to do. Codifying the real possibility test ensures consistent jurisprudence. A common and prevailing sentiment is that the tests do not produce any meaningful differences. 201 Whilst this may be so in most cases, in several jurisdictions the difference in the formulation of the tests means that there remains a potential for inconsistent outcomes. Point two zero two. Although there have been no cases identified by the author where the diverging tests have in fact led to conflicting outcomes, 203 This potential was identified by a Lord Wolf in Goff. His lordship noted that had the real danger test been applied in Sussex justices, a different decision would have been reached. 204. It has been reiterated throughout this article that Australia has a well-established common law test for judicial bias. This body of common law includes strong criticism from Australia's highest court in relation to the real danger test. 205. The adoption of the real possibility test would maintain the common law in this respect. This test would also support the Australian federal judiciary's most recent decision with respect to arbitrator bias, and consequently recognize the judiciary's competence and intellect. Ultimately, its adoption in legislation would also ensure that the judiciary's jurisprudence on arbitrator bias is consistent, remedying the start it had with the decisions of Sino Dragon and Hui. Adopting the real possibility test would also ensure that Australia's arbitrated bias test remains in line with the UKS. This would provide more clarity and certainty for Australian judges when approaching the test, as they will have another body of jurisprudence to turn to when needed. Furthermore, it would make it easier for users to engage with Australia's international arbitration system, as there will be more familiarity with the arbitrated bias test due to England's popularity as an arbitration seat. Finally, the real possibility test would ensure that Australia is in line with international best practice. The International Bar Association guidelines on conflicts of interest in international arbitration, a widely recognized and utilized international soft law document, 206 states, F, or standards to be applied as consistently as possible. The use of an appearance test based on justifiable doubts as to the impartiality or independence of the arbitrator is to be applied objectively. A reasonable third-person test. Point 207. Adopting the real possibility test ensures that the first limb of the arbitrator bias test does so. The real possibility test is a good compromise between the reasonable apprehension test and the real danger test. The real possibility test takes the best features from each test and merges them into one. The perception from the reasonable apprehension test to ensure the public's view is considered and threshold from the real danger test to ensure fanciful challenges fail. Consequently, it provides the most balanced test. Adopting the real possibility test 
would mean that Australia continues to have two different tests for judicial and arbitrator bias. However, as set out in Section 2, this adoption upholds the intention of the legislature, and those who recommended an express arbitrator bias test be codified in legislation, the objective being that arbitrators are subject to a stricter test than the reasonable apprehension test established in Australia's common law for judicial bias. Therefore, whilst it is possible to have the same bias test for judges and arbitrators as recognised in Halliburton, 208, it is not appropriate in Australia given the intention to have a higher threshold for arbitrators than that in the common law. Even if Australia adopted the same test and applied the test differently in accordance with the intricacies of international arbitration, 209 it would not remedy the low threshold of the test. Instead, it would even out the higher sensitivity that the reasonable person may have to bias in arbitration than litigation to ensure that the reasonable apprehension test was applied equally. 210. The real possibility test is best for arbitrator bias in Australia. The principles underlying the bias rule are consistent and undisputed. Public confidence must be maintained within the system whilst also ensuring that an impartial and fair decision is rendered. 211 yet. Different jurisdictions and courts have utilized different tests to uphold these fundamental principles and balance them with other competing principles, such as time and costs. As seen above, each of the three tests is distinguishable and brings its own strengths and weaknesses. Whilst the query remains about whether the tests have any real practical differences, the above analysis reveals that the real possibility test is the most appropriate test for arbitrator bias in Australia. It serves as the middleman of the three tests and combines the primary strengths of the other two tests. Conclusion The inherent uncertainty of Australia's approach to the arbitrator bias test enacted in federal law can and should be remedied by codifying the real possibility test in Section 18A of the IAA. It is evident that this test not only reflects the Australian federal judiciary's current approach, but my analysis also reveals that the real possibility test is England's current test too. Practically, legislative reform would be beneficial to ensure that the application of Section 18A of the IAA is clear to users. This would guarantee that legal professionals and the like can use the provision with ease and certainty. Whilst the provision's current uncertain application would likely be put to rest by further case law, with the lack of arbitral disputes being heard in Australia, and a limited number of international arbitration matters being heard by Australia's federal judiciary, it would be remiss to wait. The last substantial decision on this provision was from mid-2017. Who knows how much longer it would be for this provision to come before Australia's federal courts again. In the meantime, this article has provided some clarity. Legal professionals can use this clarity to approach and engage with the current provision with more knowledge and ease at the federal level. Whilst the legislature also has a clearer framework to make legislative amendments to further clarify the test. The real danger test is not commonly used anymore due to the extensive criticism it has attracted and as a result. It is important that the legislature defines the test as the real possibility test to bring certainty and align Australia with the more widely accepted bias test. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the London Court of International Arbitration. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creative commons dot org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse distribution and reproduction in any medium provided the original work is properly cited independence and impartiality australia's arbitrator bias test emma garrett author notes arbitration international volume 40 issue 2 june 2024 Pages 135 to 155, https colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093, slash arbind, slash aiae 004, published, 06 February, 2024.